everybody to today's webinar, um, which will discuss Global Greens response to coronavirus pandemic. And by Global Greens, we mean, we mean the entire community of all the, the green parties and individuals uh, around the world who make up the Global Greens. So today we've invited four speakers from each of the global federations um, to tell us a bit about their perspective on how they see corona coronavirus has been impacting their region. Yeah. And secondly, what uh, steps uh, the Greens uh, are taking politically to address this? What policies are they championing and putting forward or putting to practice? Um, and then lastly, what are the practical next steps? Specifically for us as a global movement, how can we um, internationally work together to support each other's work um, between countries, between regions, and just between the whole community of Greens? So I'd like to uh, conclude the conversation with a lot of sort of brainstorming and ideas for next steps and how we can move our movement forward. And uh, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Kelly Yen. I'm the convener of the Global Greens and I'm calling you from sunny Sweden at the moment. Um, so on the screen right now, you'll see a little pie chart of where everyone's from. We've had about 200 registrants to the call and they come from all parts of the world. So that's pretty exciting. And I'm really happy uh, that, that the Global Greens uh, is here and this is and that you you are at your you're walking the talk. So it's really a beautiful thing. So without further ado, I'd like to begin. Um, and our first speaker will be Adam ben, Bent. And he's calling from Australia. And he's the, the leader of the party and he's also a senator. And I'll invite him to say anything more that you'd like to share about who he is and what he does and what he thinks, and to tell us about. What's, what's going on in his part of the world. So over to you, Adam. Thanks, Kelly. Um, and can I say, this is, I'm coming here to you at nine o'clock in the evening from um, Wurundjeri country, where I acknowledge the traditional owners of our land in this place that we call Melbourne, um, over here in Victoria in Australia. And it is so good to be um, a part virtually of a meeting of so many uh, uh, fellow Greens from all around the world. It really makes me feel really good, especially with Australia being an island country um, uh, a long way away from many other countries. There's a um, great deal of isolation that's often involved with life in Australia. And during the corona crisis, that's been something that has probably, from a health perspective, been a benefit. But uh, it means that in so many instances where we would have been hoping to catch up with people, for example, at the um, climate summit towards the end of the year that's now been postponed. We've been lacking those. So it's really good and really heartening to um, see so many people here tonight and the participant list just keeps on growing. So thanks everyone for joining. Um, I'm, my name's Adam Bant. I became the leader of the Greens here a couple of months ago. We've got 10 members of parliament uh, in, the, um, in Australia out of 226, 227. And the, I'm, though, the only one of ours in the lower house, which is the House of Government or the House of Representatives, where we're elected from districts. Um, we've got nine senators in the upper house where there's a fairer electoral system, but ours, uh, it's a bit like Carol and Lucas in the UK, um, not so much uh, Elizabeth May now, but uh, in Canada, but we've, um, uh, where we've got uh, one, only one out of 150 in the House of Government, but that's me, and I'm the, um, the, the, the leader of our party. To give you a bit of just perspective on um, what has happened locally, and then sort of to pan out into our region just from a health perspective. The, um, from the beginning, when Australia was probably pretty slow on the uptake, um, when, uh, although coronavirus had started to devastate parts of um, China, obviously, by Europe as well. The, um, there had been um, a bit of a hesitancy in Australia to take significant action and a bit of a sense that it wasn't much more than a flu or a cold. And during January and February this year, the government wasn't really acting with a lot of urgency. And um, they certainly weren't stop 
do, um, getting our medical stockpiles in order, getting our public health system in order. And there was probably a bit of a sense from those of us like the Greens here who are advocating for a health first response that the government was moving very slowly. And we've got a conservative government here um, who uh, very much um, do in the thrall of big business. And there was also a bit of a sense that the government here was very reluctant to um, take steps to, that might uh, somehow impact on business, even though it was a, a health first, even though it would have been supporting the health of the population, that they were reluctant to do anything that might be seen as impacting on business. Um, that started to change when the significance of the um, threat became apparent and when a number of us, including us, were pushing for a more health-driven response. And um, very soon, international travel bans, or effectively travel bans, went up first restrictions to some country and then a broader de facto travel ban, which as Australia, as an isolated country, um, really for, uh, uh, flying is the way to get into and out of Australia. So that effectively meant Australia isolated itself. And um, as a result of that, plus a number of other measures that have been taken since, internal measures, very, very important internal measures, in a country of 24 and a half million, the death toll in Australia has um, been kept to 100. And that's obviously a tragic um, 100 people who have died, but the rate of death and the rate of infection has been kept relatively low. And part of that is also involved um, between states within our sort of provinces, within our country, borders have sort of harder borders have sprung up there. And there's now restrictions that have really um, not been in, in, case, in place for a very long time, certainly in living memory, but in travel between states, that is kind of unheard of within Australia. Um, we're in the phase now where there is agitation, again, from business to start lifting a lot of the restrictions. And we're having a bit of a battle now where the Conservative government wants to get back to a bit like the United Kingdom, a bit more business as usual. Um, and start having a bit more of a free-for-all and whereas um, others are more driven by the health response and are saying no let's not get back to where it was and as we look around the region we've been comparing ourselves I think from the health side a bit with um, comparison with countries like South Korea and Singapore and South Korea was very much seen as a, a litmus test for how well we were doing in testing and how well we were doing in um, containing the virus and um, the health response and of course people are looking at Singapore and seeing in Singapore a cautionary tale of lifting the social restrictions too early. I think no one enjoys the social restrictions and they're just in the process of being eased now. I've got a five-year-old daughter who was overjoyed when um, I told her uh, yes, this morning, I think that, um, that our state premier has now lifted restrictions so she's going to be able to have her fifth birthday party. Um, with uh, 15 friends uh, in, in our own home. Um, but that's something that a month, uh, a couple of weeks ago would have been unimaginable. Um, the, one of the things that it has done though in Australia is really thrown a bit of a spanner into the works with foreign policy. Australia has a formal alliance with the United States and is often referred to as the United States Deputy Sheriff in the region. And of course, with the fights that Trump is picking with China, um, our Prime Minister has, in my view, rather inexpertly just aligned himself and therefore Australia with Trump um, in calling for investigations into the, uh, the source of the, the virus and the origin of the virus and the early handlings and so on. Um, and I think uh, there's, a, there's a growing, uh, and that has had bipartisan support from our Labor, uh, Labor opposition here as well, but I think there's a growing sense in Australia that one of the things this has shown is that um, uh, in a foreign policy sense, um, there's not a clear pathway forward for countries that, uh, that want to be neither, as the Greens want Australia to be, neither formally aligned with the US or with China, but instead to have an independent foreign policy. It's shown up that there are, um, uh, siding yourself with Donald Trump at the moment in a re-election year is a pretty dangerous strategy, but one that um, I don't know if other countries are doing it, it'd be interesting to hear in the discussion, but um, for Australia to start to coattail Donald Trump and um, give uh, sucker to him and the, the, the looming global fights between the US and China seems to me an odd decision from our Prime Minister, but one that nonetheless um, the, the right wing in our country has taken up 
with gusto and seems to be looking forward to a, a stage of muscling up with China. Um, domestically, I think one of the things that it's done, you know, people may remember that over the summer, not that long ago, our country was on fire and um, we had climate change fueled bushfires completely devastating our country and parts of our country have not recovered. And um, there is, uh, uh, and just as, as the weather was starting to turn and the discussion was getting towards a discussion about both climate change and how we were going to recover from the bushfires, the coronavirus hit. And um, that's left a lot of people in the bushfire affected areas feeling that they've been ignored, but probably um, just as significantly, it's pushed climate change off the front page for a country that was burning and for many of us who thought there was a very real prospect that this could be a moment in Australia, which is a very coal dependent country. Um, and Australia, for those who don't know, if you total up all of Australia's exported pollution, uh, we're on track to be the world's largest natural gas exporter and we're already the world's largest coal exporter. Add all of that up and Australia becomes the third largest polluter exporter of pollution in the world and we'd be the sixth largest country if you took into account all of our exports. Um, it had really knocked climate change off the front page and uh, many of us here in who, who obviously want to see action on the climate emergency, I think the response has been, well, we have to drop everything to deal with the health crisis, um, but what does it mean for climate politics? And it's something I think that a few of us are still um, grappling with at the moment. And there is a bit of a glimmer of hope because if an Australian government can act according to the science when it comes to the corona crisis, perhaps they can when it comes to the climate crisis as well. Um, but it certainly has been remarked upon by many that, we've got to, that we um, need to find a way to get climate back on the front page given the irreversible tipping points that we're passing. And the last thing that I'll say is I'll just drop a link into the chat um, in a moment because we've uh, released our recovery plan. And it's called, um, so you'll get a link to this, it's called uh, Invest to Recover. And um, what we are uh, pushing for in Australia is, is, is to say, well, the government has just spent um, close to 10% of the GDP on a, a rescue package to keep the economy alive. And so if we can spend that money on um, just keeping the economy ticking over, perhaps we can also spend that kind of money on making sure our children don't have a torched planet and a devastated economy. And as part of what we're pushing for, we've been pushing for the first time in Australia for a jobs and income guarantee. Um, we're very worried that all of the social restrictions in Australia are going to devastate young people in particular. All of the jobs that have been lost are, large, are concentrated in areas where young people are employed, hospitality, retail, tourism and so on. And um, there is a very real risk, if you look back at the GFC, that young people could be unemployed or underemployed for a very long time. So we're proposing a jobs guarantee where the government um, is prepared to give, offer every young person a job on uh, nation building and planet saving projects as we recover from the crisis. And we're arguing that now is the best time to invest to tackle the climate crisis, the corona crisis and the other crises that we're facing. Um, so I might leave it there. I'll drop the link in the chat box uh, right now and say thank you so much for um, having me on and for joining us. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Adam. That was a very, that was an eye opener to hear um, what's going on in Australia. Um, and also great to hear about what the Greens are putting forward. So we'll now just move directly to the second speaker, which is Robina. And she's calling from Uganda and she serves as the first vice president of the African Greens Federation. Uh, so Robina, over to you. And again, if anyone has a question or comment, feel free to put that in the chat box. Robin, are you able to unmute yourself? Oh, yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly, uh, for the opportunity. And thank you, Adamo, for sharing those experiences. I greet you all, our listeners, and all the people here. Um, Yes, first of all, my, my speech is basically a compilation of uh, experiences and uh, what's really going on across Africa. 
uh, yeah, I wanted to really have uh, a full picture of uh, people's uh, per perceptions and experiences from the ground. So I had to share, to, to invite uh, uh, ideas and, uh, you know, to capture the discussions really across Africa. So what I'm going to present here is, is really very representative of Africa. Um, I, I would like to talk about... Uh, uh, key two or three key aspects of the negative impacts of the coronavirus on the African continent. Um, and uh, number one, of course, uh, it has impacted a lot on the trade, um, both local and international trade. Uh, as you know very well, uh, African economies is actually import-based. Africa is an import-based uh, continent. So in circumstances where uh, borders are being closed uh, within the African countries and also between Africa and the rest of the world, that means that uh, that creates really a deficit to an import-based continent. Um, general lack of supplies, of course, and closure of business, as everyone knows. Uh, even lock trade within the countries, within the population, has been drastically uh, shut down. Um, people have lost the income, of course. Not forgetting that the, the poverty levels, of course, in Africa are high. So this situation has actually, uh, you know, um, catalyzed the, the, uh, these problems of loss of income and uh, loss of actually employment and also worsening uh, the poverty, the state of poverty of the African countries. Um, still basically on trade, also the, the, the Africans actually living in the diaspora, which contribute a lot of remittances um, from their countries where they live to, to different countries of Africa, that one has also drastically reduced because, of course, wherever they are, they are in the same situations uh, at this time. Everyone, wherever they are, they are looking at the basic survival or within uh, their proximity. So you don't really expect a lot of uh, in international business to, to go on. Um, the other crucial aspect, actually, that is also the core for Africa that I would like to talk about is the tourism, you know, because these are all core sectors that bring in money, that bring in uh, uh, foreign currency to the different countries. I'll give just here an example. If you look at uh, the 10 most visited countries in Africa, for example, you know, the likes of uh, Uganda, South Africa, Egypt, Morocco, and many others, most visited countries, uh, meaning that tourism is the leading honor of, of these countries uh, for the foreign currents. Um, you find that actually uh, there is a collapse, you know, a dramatic collapse of, uh, of uh, revenue, revenue coming through the tourism sector because, of course, of the different uh, travel restrictions, uh, closing down airports, closing bars, all this means closing down on this tourism sector and also closing down really a progress. Uh, of course, there, as everywhere, there are these social problems of confinement where families, you know, are, they are together, which is very good, but also uh, very catastrophic in some circumstances, especially uh, the women and, uh, yeah, the, the women and the children, because if an income of, of a woman is uh, really... Um, curtailed, uh, the problem she's facing are not really equivalent to that of the man. In any case, a poor woman or a woman who does not have means is more incapacitated and vulnerable to domestic violence, especially in Uganda has really increased around this uh, African country, put in their ideas. Uh, of course, on the proposed recovery, uh, it's also based on the Africa being import-based at the moment. I think we have really a lot to learn from this. 
Um, yeah, in Uganda, of course, I wouldn't say there is a lot of recovery going on at the moment. Um, even also other countries of Africa, people, country, uh, governments are focused on uh, mitigating the problem, containing the virus. But if you industries sanitize to the case they, they, they are start, starting to crop up and this is really the, the trend uh, of the future for, for, for Africa to review the economic model from being import based to export based or even to be self-sustaining with a lot of potential in agriculture in many many sectors here actually um, but also, uh, in addition to that, uh, the, the African countries must promote the consumption of their local products. They have to instill faith in the, the citizens that we can do things here on our own of high quality, and then uh, these products are consumed first locally and uh, perhaps later also export. And then on the aspect of the greens uh, within the recovery here in the East Africa and also Africa, I, uh, of course, nothing much is going on, uh, but we see like we need a lot of collaboration. Of course, coronavirus has kept us apart as greens. Um, we're looking forward for the post-COVID era to, to, to strengthen our international collaboration, which is uh, one of the, uh, the ideologies of the Greens by initiating uh, maybe collaboration projects and, you know, strengthening of the, of the people and bringing in some happiness because people have been confined uh, for a long time and, you know, socially they are not really uh, okay. Then as I conclude, this is also a good experience that uh, I think in Africa we have, uh, there is a need to look at the e-governance system of governance where uh, economies are really uh, digitalized. So this sector is very virgin and uh, uh, it can be enhanced. It has helped a lot around this time of the corona where people purchase uh, supplies online or through WhatsApp or and it has somehow kept us during the, this period of the lockdown. So I just see it as a very, very good opportunity for the African countries to enhance the estate and uh, really try to uh, popularize, also build the capacity in uh, digitalizing the economy. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much all for listening to me. Have a good day. Thank you very much, Robina. That's Thank great. You. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll move on to the Americas. And well, our speaker today is Manuel Bacuidano, and he's calling from Chile. He's also a uh, representative today in the call for the Federation of the Green Parties of the Americas. And uh, otherwise, he's also president of the uh, Fundacion Instituto Ecologia Politica. So it's the green think tank in Chile. And he'll be speaking in Spanish, and I have a, we have a translator. And McFall will be uh, translating to English. Um, so I believe that Manuel will pause after uh, a few sentences, and then Anne will do a verbal translation for us all. Um, well, more than so, a few sentences. <laughs> okay. Well, they they've worked it out. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, Anne, is there anything you want to say before we begin, or we just no. pass over to? All right. Well, go ahead, Manuel. Stage is yours. Okay. Um, video. Si. Ay. No puedo iniciar el video. Y yo tampoco. Pero, Se me ha ido. Video. Ahora. Ahora sí. ¿Sí? Yo te veo. ¿Sí? ¿Está, ¿Me escuchan? Sí, sí, ya. sí. Escuchamos y te vemos. Ok. Eh, buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches a todas y a todos. Desde Chile eh, voy a conversar un poco sobre el 
el nuevo lugar, América es hoy día el nuevo epicentro del coronavirus a nivel mundial. Y eso lo ratifica la, la Organización Mundial de la Salud, donde hoy día tenemos 2,22 millones de contagiados en todo el continente, desde Estados Unidos hasta Chile. Han, ¿tú puedes traducir? Ya. Yeah. Ok. Good morning, good afternoon and good night. A very warm welcome from Chile to everybody. I'm going to talk about the Americas. And I'm going to talk about the fact that the coronavirus, uh, we are now the epicenter of the coronavirus. And according to, and that's, that, that is, uh, has been uh, affirmed by the World Health Organization, which has stated that throughout the American continent, there have been 2.25 million cases of coronavirus in the Americas. Entonces, eh... <clears throat> Hay dos países, eh, Estados Unidos y Brasil, que concentran contagiados de todo el continente americano. Y ese es un extremo. Por el otro lado, tenemos dos países pequeños, como Costa Rica y Uruguay, que tienen controlados desde hace mucho tiempo lo, el coronavirus. Por lo tanto, es un tema de política lo que está pasando en nuestro continente. ¿Sí, Anne? Yeah. Right. I'm uh, going to talk about the different countries in America. There are two countries in the Americas, the US and Brazil, which um, between them concentrate 90% of the coronavirus cases on the American continent. At the other end of the spectrum, there are two small countries in, in America, in the Americas, Costa Rica and Uruguay, who have dealt very, very effectively with coronavirus. So uh, my conclusion from that is that I would say that what is happening um, with this coronavirus question and the, the problem is a political problem, above all. Entonces, eh, Trump y Bolsonaro, hmm? están aplicando una política neoliberal para enfrentar el coronavirus, que significa darle primacía y mantener la economía por sobre la salud. Y el efecto catastrófico que está haciendo esta política eh, eh, es que en América Latina y en general, eh, no hay condiciones como en Europa o en otros países para hacer, cofi, hacer el confinamiento, es decir, el aislamiento. ¿Sí? Y por lo tanto, esta política, esta política es una política que produce, es criminal, en el sentido de que está conscientemente arriesgando grandes poblaciones para, teóricamente, mantener en funcionamiento la economía. ¿Mm? Yeah. Um, in the, uh, tr both Donald Trump and the president of Brazil, Bolsonaro, have really um, pressing on with their very neoliberal policies because their main aim throughout this crisis has been to prioritize the economy. The effect, of course, has been absolutely horrific. Uh, it has to be borne in mind that Latin America and the Americas are not like Europe. And it, hasn't been, it isn't possible in Latin America, for example, to introduce a lockdown. It's absolutely not possible because of the conditions here. And therefore, the policy pursued by both Trump and Bolsonaro amounts to being criminal. And it's risking the lives of many people and all in order to keep the economy going. Esto se basa detrás de, del neoliberalismo, pero también eh, se basa la teoría de la eh, la teoría de la buscar la inmunidad por medio del rebaño. ¿Mm? Uh -huh. ¿Y ¿Qué significa la teoría de inmunidad? 
por rebaño significa que es una teoría científica que permite pensar que después de una cantidad importante de la población, 70%, 60, eh, se podrá eh, el controlar en forma sola el, 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 el coronavirus, el avance del coronavirus. Ahora, el problema de esta teoría, que es científicamente puede ser correcta cuando se aplica a vacunas, pero es incorrecta cuando se aplica a comportamientos humanos. ¿Mm? Y por lo tanto, lo que está ocurriendo es que por las condiciones que hemos conversado, esta ideología, este, la aplicación de la, de la inmunidad por rebaño, ¿eh? está produciendo un efecto de muerte de los sectores más desfavorecidos. Ayer, por ejemplo, en Brasil murieron más de mil personas y se supone que las cifras que da Brasil están oficiales, son muy pequeñas comparado con la situación real que está existiendo en ese país. Por lo tanto, es, es importante ver eh, que, eh, por, qué se por qué se produce la falla de este sistema de inmunidad eh, de rebaño. Porque no hay vacuna. Y por lo tanto, cuando no hay vacuna, no está funcionando un principio que es fundamental para los verdes. El principio precautorio que dice cuando hay falta de evidencia científica, el problema es un riesgo y no una falla de, de causalidad. ¿Sí? Ok. Sí. Yes. Um, behind the, neo, the neoliberalism, which is very much favored by Trump and by Bolsonaro, is, is basing its approach to the coronavirus on the theory of so-called herd immunity. This, um, this theory posits the idea that once 60 or 70 percent of the community have had the illness, then the remaining people are going to be, um, you know, they're, they're going to be free of, of the virus, they're not going to be affected, they're going to be immune. However, this approach is, is <laughs> totally incorrect. It, it, they have, the principle of herd immunity does work if you're talking about people having a vaccine, if there's a vaccine against it, and then 70% of the people are given this vaccine, then yes, that protects everybody else in the community. But in this case, it is not working because there is no vaccine. What is actually happening is that the, the, the least, the, the, the poorest people in society are in fact dying. In Brazil, yesterday, the figures for the deaths of, from coronavirus were that yesterday in Brazil, more than a thousand people died. Now, these are only the official figures and the real figures are probably considerably higher. So it is important to recognize that without a vaccine, that this herd immunity approach is clearly impossible and completely ridiculous. And um, what we should be doing and what we would call for as Greens is very much the idea of following uh, the, the much vaunted precautionary principle. So if we don't know about something, then we take extra me measures to protect ourselves against it. Bueno, y entonces, eh, en ese contexto, eh, la, eh, eh, estamos preocupados de que, como el, en el caso europeo van dos semanas adelante, de lo que ocurre en otros continentes, como el caso de América, estamos preocupados porque nuestros gobiernos, la mayoría neoliberales, quieren apurar, quieren uh, la salida del coronavirus cuando aún no está controlada. ¿Mm? Ok, ¿Ah? so we, we are very worried because when we look at Europe, where you could say that the coronavirus is certainly two weeks ahead of us in the Americas, as far as its development, you know, the, the phases that it's gone through, it's definitely two weeks ahead of us. And yet the governments in America, most of which are very neoliberal, want to rush on now. They're, they're impatient to 
resume, to be able to move forward and push the economy. So they want to rush on to the next phase and we're not ready for that. Entonces, para nosotros los verdes, y yo creo que estamos de acuerdo, la mejor vacuna es proteger la naturaleza. ¿Mm? Uh -huh. for, for us um, greens, and I think we would probably all agree with this, the best vaccine we could use is to protect the environment, to protect our, you know, yeah, our environment. Y por lo tanto, eh, nosotros tenemos que combatir el antropocentrismo, antropocentrismo, ¿eh? que está hoy día, eh, eh, que tiene la clase dirigente mundial ¿eh? y que no considera a la naturaleza, no, nos, no considera a la naturaleza como el elemento central que está actuando. ¿eh? Right. So we think that what we should do as Greens now is to challenge and fight back against the very anthropocentric view, which is the one that predominates in most governments, of, uh, you know, in governments across the world. And we think that what we should be doing is to defend environment, the environment or nature, which is what can save us from this crisis. Eso es lo central. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Muchas gracias, Manuel. That's great. Well, bad news, but inspiring message for us greens. Um, so we move now to our final speaker of the day, um, Philippe Lambert, and he is a member of the European Parliament and co-leader of the Green Group in that parliament. Um, and he'll be speaking about a recently published um, recovery, COVID recovery plan uh, that represents the voice of all the Greens across Europe. Um, and I asked him to really focus on, on one message in this recovery plan that really stood out to me in which they call for more solidarity and action around the world. Um, so hopefully that will lead nicely into our discussion after Philippe's presentation. So Philippe, I'd like to pass the microphone over to you. Yeah. Hello everyone. Uh, so speaking from Brussels, uh, I well this week will be an important week in Europe because well this is the week when uh, the uh, European Commission, so the, the executive body of the European Union, uh, will present its uh, its uh, recovery plan. Now the good news is that we don't have Trump in Europe. Uh, we have few deniers about the reality of uh, of uh, the uh, dangerosity of the uh, COVID-19. Of course, uh, Europe was taken a bit by surprise, uh, like everyone else, and there was a, a clear lack of solidarity. And that's, of course, uh, that's that is, of course, was it's the most damaging. Initially, uh, masks were being prevented from uh, going to the most affected uh, country, Italy. Likewise, with re respirators. So, member states in Europe uh, played a pretty uh, nationalist self-oriented uh, 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 role and it took a while before real solidarity could show or could show up now the different countries have been affected differently by the virus so those in the south so italy spain have been severely affected uh, but likewise the united kingdom france belgium where i live uh, have also been uh, strongly affected while the east of the continent uh, eastern central and eastern europe has not been that much uh, affected. So maybe uh, because there, there, there's been less traveling, I don't know. But uh, uh, the reality is that A, the prevalence of the virus has been different across the continent, but also the practical impact. Uh, yes, Europe has gone uh, into a, a shutdown uh, for most of the continent, not all countries, but most of them. And that, of course, affects the economy. But as you know, uh, we, are, we do not have the same eco economical structure across uh, across europe uh, if you look at a country like uh, like greece well the country depends for one third of its economy uh, from tourism whereas for uh, italy it's closer to 10 percent spain lies some 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 place in between and as you know the summer is upon us now and so uh, many countries that depend on tourism will be uh, even more severely affected because even if the industry is uh, is uh, getting started again uh, tourism will be heavily affected because uh, uh, people will not travel that much as uh, as before. So 
What we need is a common economic response to that. And the Greens have been at the forefront of proposing one. So it's a macroeconomic response made up of massive public investment. Uh, you can draw a, a comparison with, uh, with Roosevelt's New Deal after the, the 1929 uh, economic collapse, the, the depression back then. We want to prevent that. And in our view, it has to be a European response. It cannot be left to the individual member states simply because they are not in the same economic uh, situation and they do not have the same economic starting point. In other terms, if you leave countries like Italy or Spain facing uh, the need for recovery on their own, uh, they will probably get into very dangerous zones in terms of public debt and that might break up the uh, monetary union, uh, so the euro, and uh, ultimately the European Union. So this is really a test for the European Union. I mean, if in this, uh, the Europeans don't stand together, now you might want to question why do we have a European Union in the first place? So this is, these are testing times. The good news is that the, how should I say, the, uh, the push for solidarity is materializing itself even in areas where in the recent past, uh, there was a clear lack of solidarity, and I think of Germany, but also the Nordic countries. So there's still resistance in, uh, in the European Union against this concept of economic solidarity. But this has now become a, a tiny minority. So uh, before the weekend, only four countries joined up in, uh, in proposing, well, in refusing basically economic solidarity. I don't know what the pressure on them will be huge uh, once the, the proposals of the European Commission are made public on Wednesday. And so we will see whether we can clinch a deal where the economic response will be a common one. We are pushing for a, well, a common response. So this idea seems to make some progress of late in Europe. So you need unanimity. We are not there. But it's going in the right direction. The second aspect is, of course, the total volume of the response. Uh, the European Parliament uh, has been arguing for a, a response made up of uh, two trillion public and private investments, of which more than the half would be public investment. And that's in the ballpark of what we need. And just to give you an idea, what we feel will be on the table is half as much. So probably not big enough. And then the third big question is, what would be the economic recovery be made up of? We claim that actually you have to make the green transformation of the economy the central pillar of that strategy. Uh, in other terms, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the economic slump that is a result of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic actually should not be an excuse to postpone the, econo the ecological transformation of the economy. Conversely, it should be used as the reason why want to accelerate it because indeed uh, what the, the pandemic has shown is that Europe uh, has gone beyond the limits that uh, that nature puts us. Uh, it has made itself very dependent uh, globally uh, because it has basically outsourced its production of masks but also medicines but also food and that is not a healthy situation to be in. So Indeed, we have to move away from the neoliberal globalization to the ecological transformation of the economy. Now, again, uh, the good news is that we don't have Trump around. Uh, and, and of course, there are <laughs> Trumpists in Europe. That's the reason why, well, why the pandemic should well, basically lead us to all this ecological bullshit. But this is a minority view. The majority view in uh, the European Union uh, institutions and in most member states is that actually, yes, we have to put <coughs> the transformation central to, uh, to the economic recovery. Now, one thing is to say it, another thing is to do it, because of course, let me take one blatant example of where all societies have gone wrong. Air transport, as you know, uh, the airline industry and the aircraft industries have been booming uh, the last uh, the last decades, with as a result, the ecological impact has been skyrocketing. Now, of course, that industry is in a deep slump now. Do we really want to spend public money to bring it where it was before the pandemic? We argue no, and that is not always popular because, of course, you have hundreds of thousands of people working in in, in those industries. So, what we say is that yes, the the, uh, the public investment must be made conditional 
to changes in the industry. No, we don't want to kill the, uh, the airline industry, but probably it will need to shrink and to adapt itself uh, to reduce its emissions. Are we going to put those conditions to those companies uh, uh, that, that seek public help uh, before they get public help? Of course, there are so many jobs uh, hanging on that, that the pressure to take shortcuts and to basically say, okay, no conditions, go ahead, you receive public help, the, the pressure will be high in, in that direction. So again, the words in terms of solidarity are getting good. The words about putting the green transformation central to the recovery uh, are there. The real, the, the, the real question is, will the action be in line with the discourse? So we have to win those battles. So I would uh, see those times as defining not just for Europe, but as to the relevance of greens to public policy. The good news is that we are about 10% of the public opinion in Europe. So we represent about 10% of the European Parliament. We are present in a, in a number of governments. So we need to use that influence to uh, push in the right direction. Uh, okay, okay, we are 10%, which means we are not irrelevant, but we may not be numerically needed. And so that, that is a bit where the balance hinges. Uh, we want to make our, our views heard and, and felt uh, using the 10% uh, 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 that we have as a leverage. But again, well, we are faced to, uh, uh, to forces that so far have advocated uh, the neoliberal version of globalization. And just to give you a, a that, that was just before the pandemic, there was a free trade agreement to be concluded between Europe and this big grand democracy called the People's Republic of Vietnam. Well, as you know, increasing trade flows uh, across the world in a context where we need to reduce our ecological footprint is just nonsense. On top of that, we were concluding that treaty with a country uh, whose uh, uh, track record on human rights and, and democracy and freedom of expression is appalling and not improving, actually worsening. Guess what? 80% of the European Parliament ratified that free trade agreement, which tells you that actually those who oppose the neoliberal version of globalization are still a minority. It's more than the Greens, but it's still a minority. So we are up for an uphill struggle, but uh, we are going to, uh, to fight it with all our energy. That's what I wanted to share with you. Thank you, Philippe. This is indeed a critical moment in time. Um, I'll just start the Q&A with a couple questions that uh, Amy Tyler, who's the Global Greens Secretary, um, and is in the call, she's been pulling out a few from the chat box and sent a few to me to just get us going. So the first one comes from Jean, uh, and he asks, how do the speakers see the role of the World Health Organization? And I'll just tack on maybe a second question before we hand it back to the speakers. A uh, second one comes from Victor from Kenya, and he asks about um, how do we see uh, the coronavirus impacting climate change and what are the Greens' views on that and how do we take our campaigning forward after, well, during this pandemic and as we move from it. So those are the first two starter questions. Are there any speakers who would like to pick those up? You can just unmute yourself and, and begin. You don't need to raise your hand. All right, uh, let's see. There's actually quite a few more questions. Uh, let's see, uh, there's an interesting one from from Papa Mesa, uh, he's had his hand up for a while. So actually Papa, I'd like to ask you to invite you to unmute. You can ask the question yourself. Okay. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to come back to what Philippe said lastly. Uh, this coronavirus, is a global is a global pandemic. My my problem is how what why when he said there is a European response. The response should be should be global. 
First, and what we note about this pandemic is the lack, the lack, the necessity to have private sector, private sector in the system. This uh, new liberal system show how we need public service to address this pandemic. And my point of view is what happened because we, we saw that in the 2008 crisis, the 2008 crisis is not similar to the COVID-19 pandemic. And during 2008 crisis, we saw how private sector came back. So in this ongoing uh, pandemic, we saw how countries where the private sector is dominant, how the number of victims is elevated and how is needed the intervention of the public sector. So for we green, what we have to learn about this. What we have to learn about this is this green ideology needed for transforming this global system. And our proposal should be how to elaborate a democratic, just economic, worldwide, global system. And I'm sure, I'm sure, uh, as uh, Philip say, we are a small percentage of the public, of the political society, all the world, the wide world around. But we can influence. We can. We can influence. Green can influence by you know. It's an evidence now that everybody is talking about this green new deal. Green new deal is not the ownership of green parties, but the fact is that they know that there is a need to come to a new global order. How will we intervene to have a green input in this new coming global order? I think that the point and that the need of reflection we are invited as a green. Thank you very much. Thank you, Papa Mesa. Great, I see some hands going up. So just to summarize, the three big questions are about what can Greens learn and do from uh, regarding multilateral organizations like the World Health Organization, regarding climate crisis, and lastly about our economic system, um, specifically the proposals we're putting forward in the Green New Deal, which aims to do that. So I saw first Adam's hand go up and then Philippe. So I'll let you speak in that order. Go ahead, yeah, thank you for that, for that question and thanks for all the other questions. I mean, one of the amazing things about speaking on behalf of Australia, but I think on behalf of a number of other countries as well, is that the things that have, in those countries where we have stayed on top of the virus and contained the deaths, the things that have got us through it are the very things that neoliberalism has been criticising for the last 30 years. So a strong public health system, the um, belief in putting human life ahead of a budget surplus, uh, the need to value science and expertise above profit. All of these things that have been under attack for 30 years are the very things that were relied on. And so we had a conservative government here um, having to do these ideological somersaults and all of a sudden start bankrolling the public health system and uh, in a way that they hadn't before. They've introduced free childcare in Australia, which is something they've been fighting against for um, a long time, these conservatives. They subsidised wages. They doubled the level of unemployment assistance, which had been at below poverty levels. They doubled it because so many people were going to be on um, uh, on the poverty line and living on unemployment assistance, that, that our conservatives had to behave like socialists in order to um, get through this crisis. The, the, so I think there's a lot in what the question is saying. The danger, there's a danger for us, which is that um, to do this, they had to go into a lot of debt. And already we've, we're seeing round two of austerity politics beginning of saying, well, 
now we've got to recover and we had to borrow so much to keep the economy alive um, that now what we've got to do is just um, pay down the debt and we're all going to have to tighten our belts even further. And I think it's a really, um, uh, the, we're at a fork in the road as to which way out. Do we go down the austerity road of more cuts or do we say no? Now is the time to invest and recover and build our way out with a Green New Deal. And the last thing I would say is that uh, we use the phrase Green New Deal here in Australia as well, even though it has not, um, people understand, some people understand what it means, but younger people don't necessarily understand what it means. Um, I, I would love to know if anyone's come up with a good name for the green economics that comes after neoliberalism, because I think names are important and I think everyone understands what, what neoliberalism is. People sort of understand what the Green New Deal is and um, what do we call our system that comes next? Because I think we all agree on the principles. I'd love to know if anyone's had any brainwaves on that. Great. Thanks, Adam. Directly over to you, Philippe. You're on mute. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so the, the, the first question was about uh, whether the, <clears throat> the pandemic helps on climate. Well, short term, yes, because indeed, uh, because of the drastic uh, economic slowdown, well, emissions which are basically linked to economic activity have been going down and resource uh, consumption as well. But that is not the solution, of course. So uh, it's no excuse for just uh, uh, shelving the Green Deal. Actually, we will need a green transformation to make these, uh, uh, these reductions in uh, resource consumption and emissions permanent. And, and this is why, indeed, we have to make sure that when we kickstart the economy, it doesn't resemble the economy uh, uh, that, we had, uh, that we had before. Now, as Adam said, the good news about this, uh, this, uh, this pandemic is that it has broken down, uh, how should I say, common neoliberal wisdom. So uh, if we had to believe the neoliberals, of course, the state was an inefficient machine in terms of resource allocation, but the market was a good resource allocator. If we had to believe them, uh, then indeed uh, uh, public services were, were not really useful. And again, market-based solutions were always better. If we had to believe them, well, uh, global uh, dependence, well, single source dependence was a good thing in, in the name of efficiency. And now we discovered the significance of the word resilience. So, uh, Many commonly accepted ideas of the neoliberal do uh, 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 religion have been destroyed and shattered by their crisis, which means that now they are on the defensive. That doesn't mean that they have lost, but they are on the defensive, and now we have to go uh, to go on the uh, offensive. Now, um, I just want to uh, to speak about this issue of multilateralism. If you read uh, our recovery plan, there's a strong uh, international in the sense of extra European uh, dimension to it. So we know uh, that Europe has to do its part in allowing the rest of the world indeed to recover uh, from that. And uh, starting with our closest neighbors in Africa, uh, but of course in other parts of the world. Yet the fact is that uh, we lack uh, working multilateralism, I mean, especially since uh, Trump has emerged, uh, that has destroyed the, 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 the rest of multilateralism that was still around. So yes, we want to reinvest in the World Health Organization, but as you know, the organization is basically uh, politically hostage to the rivalry between China and the United States. And that is not helpful. This is really not helpful. So we, we want multi multilateral responses, but let's face it, at the moment, the only, well, uh, embryonic, transnational democracy that we have is the European Union. So we try to make that one already work. And of course, engaging with, uh, with uh, other parts of the world. But as, as I said in the beginning, the very idea that we have to have a common response to the crisis uh, is still not totally accepted even in Europe. So let alone the, the, the rest of the world. Uh, thank you. There's. Oh, Manuel, back with Dan, go ahead. Un unmute yourself, Manuel. There you it's go. Okay. Yeah, okay. vamos. No, eh, <coughs> si se pudiera eh, sacar algunas conclusiones verdes, 
es reafirmar algunos conceptos que han sido fundamentales en la creación y el desarrollo de los verdes. El, uno de los conceptos más importantes, a mi juicio, es revalorizar el concepto precautorio. Porque cuando, como el caso de la pandemia, de la pandemia eh, eh, no hay una evidencia científica de, de qué es lo que lo produjo y qué lo desarrolla, hay que tenerlo, considerarla entonces como un riesgo y no como una falta de casualidad. Ese es el primer punto. Y el segundo punto es que tanto el modelo neoliberal como el modelo neomarxista, que son antropocéntricos, que han colocado al ser humano por sobre la naturaleza, están fracasando, han fracasado. Es el tiempo de la ecología política. Y los verdes tenemos que retomar un esfuerzo importante por desarrollar la ecología política que supere los modelos neoliberales y neomarxistas, porque si no, no vamos a entender en una nueva relación entre los seres humanos y la naturaleza. Anne? Sí, ok. Eh, Sorry, I had my thing on mute. Yes, I, would guess. Like, I would like to restate some green concepts which I think are fundamental and which it's very important to bear in mind at this point. The first one is that I think we should once again uh, reconsider and uh, re once again attach importance to the precautionary principle. Um, for example, in the case of the coronavirus, there was no scientific proof of what started it. And therefore, in that case, it was better to take precautions. This is a very strongly held belief of the Greens, and it's one that we should return to again and again. Secondly, I think it's important to remember that both the neoliberal model and the Marxist approach are both very, very anthropocentric. And they both have failed. And I think that really it's the time for the Greens really has come. If we want to move forward, if we want to change the world, we need to have a green approach. Ecología política. And ecological politics. Correct. Um, I see that uh, Robina also uh, would like to speak. I just, before we go there, I want to comment that I noticed that we've reached the end of our hour and that there's a lot of very interesting comments and questions on the chat box. Um, so uh, after Robin has done speaking, uh, I want to indeed thank everyone who has been here and thank the speakers for coming. I will also keep the call open so that those who are here are welcome to stay and continue a bit longer for more discussion. Speakers are also welcome to stay. Um, a note that there is a, a several questions regarding social justice, uh, how we respond to auto, the rise of autocratic governments, the use of excessive force by governments and data transparency. And that's certainly something that we see uh, around the world. So, so that's an interesting conversation to continue if you like. Um, but I'll, I'll now pass the microphone back to, to Robina. Go ahead, Robina. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Kelly. I actually wanted to comment on the question that came from Kenya uh, that was linking uh, the coronavirus pandemic to, to the environment or to the greens. I wanted uh, to emphasize something that, uh, yes, as Felipe already said, uh, there are some uh, good moments from this. It is not the trend to talk, uh, to take, but uh, there, there are good experiences. For example, of course, if you reduce all these people driving around, um, if you reduce the movement of the airplane and whatever uh, people's impacts on the environment, of course, nature is going to rejuvenate and recover. So I think uh, also on the environment bit, that uh, as I said also in my presentation that uh, we should uh, focus on the uh, capacitation of the e-governance, 
whereby any necessary um, driving, and necessary uh, levels of pollution can really be reduced by ad adopting uh, certain ways of, uh, you know, more greener ways of transacting business, uh, more greener ways of, of living, of course. So, so yeah, somehow, uh, and also during, uh, for example, here in Uganda for the last three, uh, two months, I think the, 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 the looks clear advocate for coronavirus um, into the daily, uh, you know, um, our lifestyles and uh, uh, living of, of the people globally, how we can uh, coexist with the environment and also life goes on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Robina. Okay, and the interpreter, interpreter Anne says thank you and that she has to um, go. So uh, we're losing our interpreter. But uh, again, like I said, uh, I will keep the floor open for us all to continue the discussion if you'd like. Uh, and thank you everyone for showing up today. I'll be posting the audio and video recordings of this webinar in the Global Green Facebook event page for this event. Um, so you can share it and listen to it later. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you to the speakers for coming and sharing your thank insights. You. Okay, thank you. Okay, so for this, um, before we actually move to uh, open discussion, I'd like to invite uh, the president of the Green Party of Venezuela, Manuel Diaz, to make a, an, a little announcement, which is in response to one of the questions, asking for the Global Greens to organize a discussion around World Environment Day, which is on June 5th. Well, the Global Greens are actually endorsing a Congress organized by the Venezuelan Greens. Uh, on that very day. So Manuel can tell you a bit more about that. Um, Manuel, go ahead. I Hola, Ke Hola Kelly. Oh, wait. Oh, uh, uh, video? Okay. Sorry, before you begin, is there anyone who can translate from Spanish to English? Hola, y si puedes colocar el video? Yo, eh, si. Sí. I just okay. wonder if there's any uh, traductor. Is there any translators who can help us? I can, I okay. can do an okay job if necessary, if there's no okay. one else. Oh, no Amy, one. thank you. Yes. That's great. Okay, Amy will translate. So, so go ahead, Manuel. Okay, quiero saludar a, a la coordinación mundial de la Global Green. No tengo video, pero estoy saliendo aquí. Ahora sí. Um, uh, I'd like to say Quiero. hello to the Global Greens coordination. Uh, I don't have any video right now, but hello to everybody. Y aprovechar la oportunidad para invitar al segundo congreso mundial virtual de la ciudadanía verde y al lanzamiento mundial de la prueba de cultura climática. And I'd like to take this opportunity to invite everyone to the second congress for uh, World Environment Day and Climate. Sorry, Manuel. Es un esfuerzo de la sociedad civil ambiental mundial apoyada por la ecopolítica, del cual ya estamos contando con el respaldo de la Global Green y de las federaciones, en el caso de la Federación de los Partidos Verdes de las Américas. Aprovecho la oportunidad para invitar a las demás federaciones. So this is a civil society uh, force and movement um, that is backed by the Global Greens as well as the Federation of the Americas. Um, and I'd like to invite everybody to come along. Y me parece oportuno este webinar que puede ser una antesala de la postura de los verdes para que en un panel de ecopolítica eh, puedan, eh, pueda plasmarse con estos ponentes o los ponentes que decida la Global Green, del cual ya se ha sumado, Green Forum, que va a respaldar en este panel. Y, al, y también abierto que si hay algún otro planteamiento para la participación es bien significativo. And I'd like to open the um, possibility for a panel of eco-politics. Um, we are having one that will have the Green Forum uh, participating. 
Um, but I'd, I'm also open to other ideas for an eco-political um, panel. El evento lo vamos a realizar de manera virtual el 5 de junio, Día Mundial del Ambiente, de 8 de la mañana a 12 del mediodía. Y podemos registrarnos a través de la página web www.congresofunvive.com. Yes, um, so it will happen on the 5th of June um, at 8 a.m. to midday. And I'm going to, he said the web page, but I'm just going to post it in the chat. Uh, for everybody, so you can find it easily. Finalmente, hemos recibido la salutación en el acto inaugural de la coordinadora mundial de la Global Green, Kelly Jane, que da como eh, esas palabras de estímulo a los verdes del mundo con la sociedad civil, en base a lo que aquí se ha expresado, para entender que es el momento de la ecopolítica. Muchas gracias. And, and, and finally, thank you so much um, to Kelly, who... Um, give such strong words, um, important words for the, for the Greens, the global Greens, and um, that this is a moment for the eco-politics. Perdóneme que agregaría algo. Es un compromiso de todo el movimiento ecológico de Venezuela, el Partido Verde en Latinoamérica, el movimiento ecológico de Venezuela, que está llevando adelante esta hermosa idea. Sorry, I just, I just missed that. Me falta la última parte, perdón, Manuel. Es que no lo escuché. ¿Qué? que es una expresión, no esta, esta organización del evento es con todo el apoyo del Movimiento Ecológico de Venezuela, el Partido Verde de Venezuela, que está comprometido para llevar adelante esta gran iniciativa y convertirse en un modelo de crecimiento de los partidos verdes en América Latina. Ajá, uh ya. -huh, yeah. And so this uh, World Forum and the movement, the, social, the civil society movement has the full support um, of the Green Party of Venezuela. Okay, great. Thank you, Manuel. Gracias. So check the chat box for the web link to the next edition of the global conversation that we're in um, for World Environment Day. The theme this year is biodiversity, which is really a perfect uh, focus for both the, the cause of the pandemic and the solution since it's the degradation of our ecosystems and biodiversity, which is really making these infectious diseases spread more rapidly than ever before. So I think it's a very relevant topic for this year. Okay, I've seen, I just wanna check, Philippe, are you still in the call? Philippe Lamberts? I am. All right. Um, I wanted, I'd like to hear your views on the bunch of questions related to democracy, because it, it really touches us all uh, about the rise of authoritarianism, um, the threat and reduction of human rights uh, protections, um, excessive use of force by governments, as well as the use of data. These are all issues that have been quite core to the politics in Europe. Um, so, uh, to hear what, how the Greens in Europe are addressing these issues. Well, uh, that is probably the area which worries me most because indeed uh, one might say that the pandemic is making the point for the green transformation uh, quite powerfully, but likewise it is, uh, how should I say, uh, it is legitimizing uh, severe inroads into uh, uh, civil liberties in the name of guaranteeing security, in this case, uh, se uh, uh, health security. Uh, we had the same thing at the moment of the, the terror attacks in Europe, where in the name of providing security, uh, states started uh, or, or expanded their data collection on, on, on citizens. Uh, widely, and there's a severe risk that this happens now in the name of uh, health security. And so, yes, we are very uh, watchful about that. It's a very uh, tough battle to make because, indeed, uh, many citizens will say, yeah, well, you know, if we want to have security, we have to accept that we lose some of our uh, freedoms. And, and that trade-off between security and freedom uh, is one that has been around for uh, centuries, actually. And we know that uh, backtracking on that is all too easy. I mean, backtracking on, on uh, uh, freedoms that we have won is always difficult. On top of that, you have another aspect, and you mentioned it, uh, the rise of authoritarianism. Uh, 
well, that was already on the way even within the European Union before the pandemic. I mean, uh, when you look at the way member states are drifting, I think, of course, of uh, uh, the governments in Hungary or in, uh, in Poland, but not, not just there, you know. Uh, if you look uh, how the French government has been uh, implementing emergency uh, laws in, uh, in, in ordinary law, this is, really, uh, this is really worrying. So you see the natural drift of any power to uh, concentrate power even more and to abuse it. It's always been there. And that is why in democracy, we have checks and balances, but, uh, but we know that uh, these checks and balances are always fragile. So they are even more fragile now. Now, I would just like to say that we are not giving up on, on that battle, far from it. And I'm rejoiced at the fact that those parties which, uh, which carry a very, uh, national populist agenda, uh, which basically wants uh, want to make uh, uh, well to implement strong regimes in Europe, they have not been winning uh, uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. On the contrary, they've been rather on the losing side. Now we should not be complacent because it won't always be like that. Uh, but then again, uh, they are on the defensive, like the neoliberals. So if you see the uh, political landscape as a triangle between on one uh, uh, point of it, neo the neoliberal globalization, which has been hegemonic ideologically for the last 30 years. And if you see national populism and green politics as the two alternatives to it, obviously uh, we are the ones reinforced by, uh, by the pandemic. But again, it's not because we are reinforced that we will be winning. I mean, we have to work and work hard in order to, uh, to make that happen. But our ideas uh, are, I think, on the winning side of the equation. We just have to go out and demonstrate, uh, well, win a, a majority of our, of our population over, not just on the green transformation side, but also on the democratic side of it. And again, I mean, green politics is about preserving uh, nature. It's about preserving social justice or furthering social justice. And it's about promoting democracy. So more just, more sustainable and more democratic societies. That's what we defend. We, are all, we have our work cut out for us. Uh, it won't be easy, but I think that actually the pandemic has opened new avenues for the, the green transformation. So let's use them. Great. Um, just so just noting that we're 20 minutes over and there's such good conversation going um but i do want to help us come to a close as well we've also downloaded the chat so that will be saved and if you'd like to have a coffee send a message to the global greens through the secretary at globalgreens.org email or you can contact us on the facebook event page again i'll be posting the recording there so, uh, and there's lots of discussion forum space. So you're welcome to continue posting your ideas and questions and comments on our Facebook page for this event. Uh, so let's continue like that. And we'll keep an eye on the discussion and follow up with you uh, around next steps, since that's, it's very important to put our words into action. Uh, so a big round of applause and uh, gratitude to all of you for, for being in this movement and taking us forward. Thank you. And I will end the call uh, in about three minutes. So you can take off yourselves off mute and say goodbye if you'd like as well. Yeah, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you, nice Kelly. You. Oh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Goodbye to all from thank Canada. Canada. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. 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 Bye. 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 Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.
Hello, my people from, from South America. Emanuela and Moses. Hello from Papa from Senegal. Also, hi from South America to Senegal. Emma from Hungary. Peter from Australia. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yes. Bye bye. Thanks for having us. Okay. Over and out. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly. Thanks, Kelly. Hey, Miriam. Hey, hey, Kelly. Hey, 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 Kelly. I would like. I would like. Kelly, I would like to have discussion with Manuela from, he, he pointed very good question, Manuela, this is the speaker, one of the speakers is Manuela. Manuel. Yeah. Yes, Manuel, he, he pointed very good question. I don't know how to continue to have exchange with him, please, you can put us in contact, thank you. Yes, I actually will post Manuel's speech um, in, in with either Spanish or English, I'll post it in a, the Facebook page and along with his contact. Thank you. You can follow up with him then. Thank you, Kelly from Australia. Oh, thank you. Who is that? Jonathan thank King. you, Kelly. Ah, Jonathan cool. King from Australia. Hi, Jonathan. That, thank you very much. Thank you, Kelly from, thank thank you, Kelly from Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. Yeah, Sri Lanka. I, I am president of Green Political Movement in Sri Lanka. Oh, Hello. good. Good luck. Hello. Keep up the hard work. It's a long, Thank you very much. A long Thank you very much. We are with you. We are with you. Continue. <laughs> we are Kelly. one family. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much Hassan. from Peter. From the local. Peter, Peter Thank from you Australia. Very much. The talks were really impressive. And they were also very instructive. We have uh, really benefited from uh, knowledge from the Greens. Thank you very much. El Morabit from Morocco. Thank you, El Morabit. Jonathan King also uh, requested that Adam Bant's email be posted for recommendations for uh, the names. That's right. Through the chat. Okay. So that might be a good idea. Thank you very much, Kelly. Yes. Good night. Okay, I'll get his Jonathan, email. What state are you in? Thanks, Fred. Peter and Jonathan, what state are you in? New South New Wales, South St. George, Wales. St. George oh, Greens. St. George, okay. Yes. I'm in New South Wales. Wales. Just yeah, around the corner. I'm now in Melbourne. Oh, good on you. <laughs> good to see you. <laughs> Thank you very much oh, from uh, oh, Madagascar. Oh, what a lovely place. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. This is Gia. Hey, Gia. Thanks. From the Philippines. <laughs> Another lovely place. Ben, thank you, everybody from Madagascar. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Kelly, what are you doing in swing? Did you say you're in swing? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. <I> <laughs> I fell in love with a Swede and, and got married and had a baby here. Oh, <laughs> Life is full of surprises. <laughs> Life is like that. <laughs> Lots of interesting twists and turns. Not too cold out there? Uh, yeah, it gets pretty cold, but it's just the spring is finally coming. <laughs> bye bye, Kelly. Bye bye, Miriam. Over and out. Stay safe. Bye. Yeah. Goodbye. From Morocco. Bye. Bye. Thank you, green people. Bye. 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 Uh, what time is it? Two thirty in the afternoon. Ah, okay. Yeah. okay. And, yeah. and it's, it's probably about ten thirty. Yeah. <laughs> Miriam was one of the first uh, people I met when I got involved in the Greens in yeah. like two thousand 
1969, and we worked together to organize the Asia Pacific Green Federation Congress in Taiwan. So we had we, we did good work, didn't we? We we, we were a team, weren't we? <laughs> it was good. Yeah, it was lovely to meet you. <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing how relationships get built uh, just yeah. through Zoom meetings like this. Yeah, <laughs> relationships right. that last a lifetime. <laughs> are you still in touch with the Taiwanese Greens? Yes. Yeah, they they're still going strong. They yeah, good. Yeah, politics is hard. Uh, so so the, <laughs> like all parties, it's there's ups and downs and always difficult um, yeah. growing party. But they're, they're, I think they're a very solid uh, yes. political movement. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Robin's still there? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Active, as always. That's great. <laughs> okay, I'm going to just uh, end the call because I see more people are dropping off now. So, um, And nobody else is on video. Oh, one person. Who are you? Do you have Javier Molina from Bolivia? From Bolivia. Ah, okay. Yes, nice to meet you. I'm Javier Molina from Bolivia. Are you in La Paz? No, I'm from Cochabamba. Uh, no, that's, yeah, I don't know it. <laughs> yeah. Is that in the mountains? Uh, Isabella. Yeah. It's my first meeting. Oh. Yeah, also, too. I want to say that if you have any suggestions for future webinars, um, feel free to post that. So I, I love oh, to hear, okay. I, hear your ideas on what we should do next. Well, Kelly, okay. Kelly I, um, I'm very interested in, um, I read an article recently about the, 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 the Spanish flu back in 2017 or whenever it was, um, they, the article which has correlated the, uh, the deaths in the Spanish flu to the rise of the Nazi party 10 years later in Germany. Hmm. Oh, I didn't know about that connection. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Yeah, I can send you the article if you want. Yeah, yeah. please send that through. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you could post it on the Facebook event page so others can read it too. Oh, all right. Or you can send yeah. it to me and I'll post it there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay, bye. Okay. Bye. bye. Arisa, thank you, Kelly. Oh, thank you. Who is that? Uh, that's Hariaksha from uh, Arizona, US. Oh, from Arizona. Yeah, yeah. Thank cool. you. What a wonderful, wonderful webinar. Thanks a lot. Yeah, well, oh, great. I'm curious, how did you hear about the webinar? Um, maybe I got a, a direct email from you. I don't know. Maybe Facebook. I, I, oh, oh, and Tara Bissell in Arizona also announced it at our state committee meeting. Oh, that's great. I, yeah. It's always tough to get the word out to all the network screens everywhere. Oh. So that you said that uh, mm -hmm. politics is hard? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, striving for happiness, <laughs> future focus. <laughs> Good. Well, especially the United States, since they're so it's such a big country. Um, yeah. If you see, if you can help to spread the word when there's stuff going on with the global greens, I'd appreciate it. If you're in yes. the US, if you're in the US, you're much better off being social contact through Zoom rather than through, through the streets. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Okay, now I'll sign off. <laughs> All right, okay. bye. Thank you, Kelly. Bye. Are you? Are you, Min Van? Are you, Min Van? Are you, Min Van?